So I'm here to uh, present the current evidence and then um, my um, colleagues will dig a little bit more into some of the pragmatics about delivery of some of these non-invasive respiratory supports. So first of all, what evidence do we have for use of uh, non-invasive respiratory support to avoid intubation? So using it before we've moved to um, uh, invasive mechanical ventilation. So I'm going to talk a, bit, a little bit about high flow nasal cannula and a little bit about non-invasive ventilation. So starting with high flow, um, so we uh, use high flow nasal cannula with the assumption that it will improve gas exchange for our patients and modulate inspiratory effort. And this is because high flow nasal cannula, as long as patients are breathing with their mouth closed, generates flow dependent positive pressure effect of approximately seven centimetres of water. There's also upper airway washout that reduces dead space and the active heating and humidification we use with high flow nasal cannula really does help promote comfort in patients and maintain airway muco mucosal integrity. So in 2020, there were guidelines that were published uh, to uh, tell us how we should consider using high flow nasal cannula and there was a strong recommendation that this should be considered as first line treatment in acute hypoxemic respiratory failure compared to use of standard oxygen therapy alone. So as I said, these were published in, in 2020 based on the evidence there. So I'm just going to highlight some of the evidence that has been published since that point in time. So obviously, um, some of the evidence is going to be focusing around the COVID patient population as they were dominant in our ICUs at that time. And so this paper that was published in JAMA last year looked at the use of high flow oxygen therapy compared to conventional um, and looked at intubation and clinical recovery, so time to clinical recovery. And you can see there that there was a benefit in the use of high flow nasal cannula compared to conventional oxygen therapy in terms of need for intubation and also time to clinical recovery. This other study very recently published in JAMA, the SOHO, Co Soho COVID study, which I think is a quite a cool uh, name for a study. Um, so this was 711 participants and 34 French ICUs. Um, and this uh, looked again at mortality and also at intubation rates. And you can see there, there was no difference in uh, the mortality of patients with high flow nasal cannula compared to standard oxygen therapy, but there was a reduction in intubation rates with high flow nasal cannula. So that's some of the additional evidence we have for high flow nasal cannula reducing intubation. Moving on to the use of non-invasive ventilation. So back in 2017, which is now five years ago, there was a lot of work that was done uh, by the European Respiratory Society and the American Thoracic Society together to produce a set of guidelines about using non-invasive ventilation. And despite the um, forest plots indicating that there was uh, a reduction in intubation, these guidelines make no recommendation for use of face mask non-invasive ventilation for de novo hypoxemic respiratory failure. <coughs> so since that time, there has been um, some more systematic review work. So this systematic review work uh, published in JAMA looking at the various types of non-invasive oxygen strategies um, in uh, acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. So they identified 21 relevant studies, recruiting over 3,000 patients, so a good uh, cohort of patients. And when compared again to standard oxygen therapy, they identified that there was a low mortality risk with helmet NIV, and there was also a lower mortality risk just with face mark um, NIV, with an absolute difference of 0.06. And so they also looked at intubation rates, again, comparing to standard oxygen therapy, 25 studies and nearly 4,000 patients. And again, they identified lower intubation risk with helmet NIV, lower intubation risk with face mask NIV, and lower intubation risk with high-flow nasal cannula. 
So there's been a couple of other studies that have been published since that set of uh, systematic reviews and meta-analyses was done. So this study, uh, published quite recently, um, was conducted, and this study was comparing helmet NIV with face mask NIV, and again, looking at rates of intubation. And so in their protocol, they used face mask NIV for eight hours, and then they randomised to either continue with face mask or switch to helmet NIV. Their primary uh, outcome was intubation, and you can see there there's quite a dramatic uh, difference in the rates of intubation with a lot lower rate with use of helmets. They also looked at 90-day mortality, and you can see there there was a, a not the totally non-statistical significant but a lower rate of mortality with the helmet group. But this trial was stopped early for efficacy, so we always have to be very careful looking at evidence with trials that are stopped early, and their planned sample size was actually 206 participants uh, looking for a 20% reduction in the rate of intubation with an 80% power. So another study that was published in JAMA last year, again, so this is looking at helmet non-invasive ventilation, comparing it to high-flow nasal cannula. And so their primary outcome was uh, median <coughs> days free of respiratory support, any form of respiratory support, at day 28. And you can see there that when they compared helmet to high-flow nasal cannula, there was no difference in the numbers of days free of respiratory support at day 28, but there was a difference, again, in reintubation <coughs> rates. Another study, again, recently published, so this study just came out in this last year, very recently published in Lancet Respiratory Med. And so this is a study looking specifically at acute hypoxemic respiratory failure in immunocompromised patients. And so they compared high-flow nasal cannula alone with a strategy of alternating NIV. And they recruited uh, 299 participants in 29 ICUs. And you can see there that looking at the, uh, the survival curves, the 28-day 28 mortality, 28 mortality was exactly the same using high-flow nasal cannula versus NIV, and the intubation rates were not statistically significant. So rather than taking this as a negative trial, the authors posited the conclusion that potentially <coughs> high-flow nasal therapy could be considered an alternative to NIV and that NIV might possibly not be recommended as the first-line treatment in this patient population. A little bit debatable, um, uh, but we also need to take into consideration patient comfort elements with high-flow nasal cannula and maybe this is a potential reason why we might choose high-flow nasal cannula if there is no difference in these important outcomes. So another uh, more recent, again, systematic review and a network meta-analysis. So a network meta-analysis allows us to do comparisons that weren't necessarily the head-to-head -head comparison of the individual trials. So it gives us a lot more detail on um, different effects of different treatments looking at the same patient population with the same outcomes. So in this paper, they identified 25 studies, again, just over 3,000 patients. And when they looked at short-term mortality, they identified that it was non-invasive ventilation compared to standard oxygen therapy that was statistically significant in terms of short-term mortality and high-flow nasal cannula or invasive mechanical ventilation was not. Um, and they also looked at intubation, and again, it was non-invasive ventilation that was indicating that there was a benefit in terms of intubation rates. And so also just wanting to highlight the recovery <coughs> RS trial that was published again this year in JAMA. So again, this is a trial that was conducted in COVID patients, led by Gavin Perkins and conducted here in the UK. And so they used a three-arm trial. They compared CPAP to high-flow nasal cannula to conventional oxygen therapy in COVID patients. 
they recruited uh, just over 1,000 patients, just over 1,200. And again, this is not the uh, anticipated sample size they were aiming for at the beginning of the trial. So in reality, is a trial that was stopped early. And one of the reasons that they stopped it early was the, the, the reduction in the numbers of COVID patients that were coming through our hospitals in the UK. So their primary outcome was intubation or mortality, so a composite outcome. And you can see here they used the conventional oxygen therapy as the control arm uh, for both CPAP and high flow. And so there was a uh, reduction in the primary outcome with the use of CPAP. There was also, a, there was not a reduction in the primary outcome with the use of high flow nasal cannula compared to standard oxygen therapy. And there was a difference favoring CPAP when they looked at the comparison of CPAP versus high flow. But they also identified more adverse events and more serious adverse events, even though the rates were relatively low in the trial. So I'm going to move now to the evidence for non-invasive support to avoid re-intubation, so patients that have experienced a period of intubation. So again, going back to those 2020 guidelines on high-flow nasal cannula, there was a conditional recommendation to use high-flow nasal cannula over standard oxygen therapy following extubation, but only four, tri four trials comparing to oxygen and three trials comparing to NIV. So very uh, not very certain in the evidence at that point in time. So again, what trials have been published since that point in time? So this trial was recently pub published in the Blue Journal, and it's slightly different. It's comparing high flow versus venturi mask oxygen therapy. They recruited uh, just under 500 patients in 13 ICUs. And just a caveat, this trial was actually conducted a few years ago, but has only uh, recently been published. So they identified no difference in the 72-hour reintubation rates. And oh, this is missing a 17. I actually fixed this, and that's not been um, updated. This is actually 8 versus 17% um, in terms of rescue NIV favoring, and, um, favoring the high-flow nasal cannula. So again, more guidelines that were published, again, now five years old. So Eddie Fan led... Um, a whole bunch of work looking at when we should use NIV in patients that are considered high risk of um, reintubation need, but passing a spontaneous breathing trial. And in their meta-analyses, they consistently show that there was benefit in using non-invasive ventilation in terms of extubation success, reducing ICU length of stay, short-term mortality, but no difference in long-term mortality. And so this ATS, ACCP, Clinical Practice Guideline, made the recommendation that in patients at high risk of extubation failure who had been receiving ventilation for more than 24 hours and passed a spontaneous breathing trial, they should be extubated to preventative non-invasive ventilation with strong to moderate certainty in the evidence. Since that time, um, so this recently published in Intensive Care Medicine, published this year, again, a systematic review with a network meta-analysis allowing us to do comparisons that weren't directly necessarily made in the, in the trials when they were conducted. So in this piece of work, we have 36 studies and 200 shy of 7,000 patients in these trials. So we're now looking at really big size uh, systematic review meta-analyses. And so this was looking at the use of non-invasive respiratory support, so both non-invasive ventilation, high-flow nasal cannula, and comparing to conventional oxygen therapy. And so in this review, they identified that there was reduced need for reintubation with non-invasive ventilation and high-flow nasal cannula compared to conventional oxygen therapy, but there was no difference when they compared non-invasive ventilation to high-flow nasal cannula. They also looked at mortality, and there was no difference consistently across all the comparisons in this network meta-analysis. Just highlighting another recent study, uh, post hoc analysis of a previous trial of non-invasive ventilation plus high-flow nasal cannula versus high-flow nasal cannula alone. And so this post hoc analysis was looking at obese and overweight patients and the differences that we might see when we look at those groups of patients compared to normal or underweight patients. 
And they did indeed identify a difference with better um, protection against reintubation using non-invasive ventilation in the obese or overweight patient population and also lower in ICU mortality in the obese and overweight patient, but no difference when they looked at the normal and underweight patients. Again, this is a post hoc analysis. It's not a direct um, outcome of the trial, but it gives us some thinking about whether we should consider um, patient characteristics and body habitus a little bit more when we're choosing our treatments. So sort of bringing this together, um, what does this all mean in terms of our practice? So this uh, is a, a graphic from a recent publication um, that Laurent Brochard and colleagues wrote. And so they were uh, recommending that for high flow nasal cannula, um, evidence that we should be using um, this in our acute hypoxemic respiratory failure patients, mm -hmm. evidence that we should use it in extubation, and I haven't touched on hypercapnic respiratory failure um, as that wasn't my brief with this talk. Face mask NIV, again, I have some evidence that we potentially should be using it for hypoxemic respiratory failure and using it in post-extubation, potentially in hypercapnic and obese patients. And use of helmet NIV, and helmet NIV is not commonly what we use in the UK, but is established practice in other countries, and so evidence potentially to use helmet NIV. So in conclusion, I think in reality there's a lot of ongoing debate as what is the optimal non-invasive support pre-intubation. I think we have got trials that tell us that compared to conventional oxygen therapy, High flow nasal cannula will reduce the need for intubation and is recommended as a first guideline in first line treatment in guidelines. But I don't think that means that we slap them on to everybody. And high flow nasal cannula has no effect on mortality. Considering non-invasive ventilation, and it will reduce the need for intubation and potentially reduce mortality, but we need to think about the interface we use and we need to think about patient characteristics and potentially body habitus. When we compare high flow nasal cannula versus non-invasive ventilation, at the moment, it looks like there's no difference in outcomes such as uh, intubation and mortality. But again, we do know our patients tolerate high flow nasal cannula better. And in post-extubation in high risk patients, which again is a bit of a clinical judgment, <coughs> non-invasive ventilation and high flow nasal cannula do reduce reintubation rates, potentially won't affect mortality. And again, we need to consider our patient characteristics. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you.